We've got sobering updates for key parts of the economy, including some shocking estimates from the government on housing that undermine reflation, if not the sticky CPI. Not only do they spike the idea of resurgent demand, they also reveal and expose the underlying truth in the consumer price measures themselves. On top of the housing statistics, also demand numbers for crude oil, showing that demand there is nowhere near reflation. In fact, oil prices are falling today because the market is now fading war fears in the Middle East, and it's looking around at the real economy not liking what it's seeing. So what does all of this mean for future CPIs? More importantly, what is all this data really saying about the state of the economy? Now, where it comes to the CPI, more than half of the gains more recently are shelter as well as energy costs. So let's start with the shelter end of things. We're going to look at some statistics from the Census Bureau on construction, home construction, residential construction, permits and starts. Now, this is stuff that we don't normally cover here on the YouTube channel, but I do go over it regularly in our daily briefing. And I'll use this occasion to remind you that we, do, we are having a, our spring sale at Eurodollar University for a couple more days. We're closing it down on Friday. You get one month free on either the membership or the daily briefing. Cancel any time in the first 30 days. No risk to you. Tremendous savings on annual rates for both of those, as well as the deep dive analysis. And if you package all three together, the daily briefing, the membership, and the deep dive analysis, we got a really low price on all of that. Again, a couple more days. Friday's the last day for the spring sale. Check it out at our website, eurodollar.university. Now, what the uh, government report, the Census Bureau reported on housing was a downturn in constructions. According to their figures, total permits were down about 4% in March and are still down about 22% from the peak, which is attributable to rate hikes, mortgages, everything else that you've heard. But there has been wild swings in the data more recently. In fact, we had a 12% decline in, in starts in the month of January and then a 12% increase in February, which many people attributed to cold in January, the normalization in February. But then the latest numbers for March down 15%. And this is month over month. So huge very volatility and variation in the construction statistics to start out 2024. As far as the single family segment goes, there's been some volatility there too, especially lately. In the month of March, the permits number the number of permits that were filed were down almost 6% from February, which was noteworthy because it was the first decline in this series since December of 2022, because the single family segment, builders have been looking at that as an opportunity ever since the downturn in 2022 with the initial eruption of higher mortgage rates. So builders have been somewhat optimistic about the single family segment, filing more permits and actually doing some more starts as well even though they've had to offer some concessions on prices along the way. So now all of a sudden there's a decline in March of 2024, and a pretty substantial one um, that that's, goes against the trend that had been existing for well over a year. Now, maybe that's just a one month decline and maybe it'll turn around next month and it's nothing more than a statistical aberration. Maybe there's something else happening here. As far as starts go, actual projects and units started in the single family segment, those were down 12.4% in March. So it's not likely if this is a real thing, if this volatility is picking up some changes in the behavior of either builders or their customers, it's not likely to be interest rates because during this period in question up to the month of March, interest rates had remained stable. U.S. Treasury rates did not pick up until April. And it is Treasury rates that determine mortgage rates, not the Federal Reserve. In fact, all you need to do is look at a chart of mortgage rates, the average 30 year mortgage, for example, against middle term or longer term treasuries like the seven or 10 year. And they line up close enough, almost exactly, to show, to perfectly demonstrate, factoring in some differences and spreads along the way, that it's the treasury market that sets the mortgage market. And with treasury yields largely stable to start this year, that's not what we're seeing in, single in the single family segment. So maybe some weakening there as builders are thinking demand for new builds isn't holding up the way that they had anticipated all throughout last year and to start this year. Now, what the CPI tells us is that there's robust demand for all of these things. If we take the shelter numbers at face value, the fact that they consistently rise by an unhealthy rate 
month after month after month, they're being very sticky, suggests that, again, if we take the numbers at face value, demand must, re must remain robust for both parts, either the single family segment or for apartments, real actual rentals. Because remember, a huge chunk of the CPI is owner's equivalent rent, which is derived from home prices. And if there's some weakness in the single family segment where demand is not keep keeping up, then there should be some relief as far as price pressure, suggesting that maybe there is something to this slowdown in housing demand that is being picked up by developers. But that was not the shocking, the most shocking aspect of the construction figures. That came from, real shocker came from, multi-family construction. According to the Census Bureau, for the month of March, the number of permits filed to build uh, multi-family apartment units was about 433,000. That's a seasonally adjusted annual rate, which was the same rate as in February. And it had been as low as 419,000 in January. So these are relatively low levels, suggesting that at the very least, developers and builders are not seeing any pickup in demand. They're thinking that demand is going to continue to fall off. And we really see that the big shocker in all of the statistics was in multifamily starts. Those tumbled, and I mean tumbled, to a seasonally adjusted annual rate of 290,000. That was down more than 20% just in March alone from February. February had been 366,000, which was not a great number to begin with. In fact, that is 44% less then last March, 290,000, any number below 300,000, I mean, the last time that was comparable, the last time this has happened in the number of multifamily starts was April and May of 2020. Going back to 2014, when the housing market finally normalized after the big housing bust in you know, 2007, 2008, 2009, when apartments construction finally normalized in about mid-decade around 2014, there had been only five times between 2014 and April, May, 2020, where the number of starts was thought to be below 300,000 at a seasonally adjusted annual rates, which tells us that builders are seeing something or doing something or responding to something that doesn't look like what's in the CPI. So if demand is robust, then why aren't builders actually building? Why aren't they filing a lot more permits because they see this demand and, and realize that the only way to fill it is to build more apartments? Not only are they not building more apartments, they're building less. Well, they're building more apartments, but the number of new apartments they're building is a lot less than it was just a year ago. And it's a lot less in March than it had been in February. If rents really were rising in the way the CPI or other consumer price numbers re, uh, project, then builders would be, they would absolutely be building a lot more apartments, but they're not. And it's not high interest rates either, because even though interest rates are higher and the borrowing costs to fund these projects would be much higher, relatively higher, if rents were indeed rising the way the, the consumer price numbers have them, then that would be more than enough to offset the increased borrowing cost. If you thought rents were rising at half a percent a month nationally, then you would be thinking, okay, it's worth it to pay the higher borrowing costs to build a lot more projects because the demand is absolutely there. So builders are telling us the demand is not there. And we have any number of evidence that shows the, the consumer price numbers are off in their own planet. They're in a different world. For example, rents.com, you go into their website and they show you the median rental asking price. And it has been flat since 2022, not talking about minimal increases, but basically going nowhere for going on a, a year and a half now. Their March 2024 number, the national median asking rent, was 1987. Their March 2023 median rent was 1972. That doesn't look anything like the CPI. In fact, that explains a lot about why builders are cutting back on the amount that they're building. And anecdotally, we hear this too from industry sources on the inside that the number of concessions and the amount of concessions that especially new projects have to offer to fill up have expanded greatly. We're hearing some new projects offering two, maybe even three months of free rent just to get people to move in. Demand is not there. The CPI is picturing a phantom ghost of imputations and builders are telling you that demand is not there because if it was, they would be absolutely jumping at the chance to take advantage of it. And they're not. They're actually going in the opposite direction, which not only raises questions about the consumer price factor, what does that really say about the real economy? 
As I mentioned, the other big problem with consumer prices is oil and energy and gasoline. Oil prices, many people are saying oil prices are up because demand is being resurgent. I've talked about this before. We don't see that in China. But what about the United States? The U.S. government released statistics on energy use, energy inventories, petroleum, gasoline, all of that kind of stuff. Now, we should note that oil prices are down more than $2 today, still in the 80s, about 83.20 at last check, because of fears of Middle East conflict spilling over, becoming even more of a supply factor, are indeed fading. And as this geopolitical premium fades from the oil market, oil traders are forced to look at demand and trade on demand, or at least more exclusively on demand, and they're not liking what they're seeing either. Sort of like the just what builders are, are doing and responding to in their part of the marketplace. Oil traders are thinking, yeah, if it wasn't for the Middle Eastern conflict and some other key uh, supply factors, what would oil prices actually be? They sure as hell wouldn't be in the high 80s. And they probably wouldn't be in the 80s or 70s at all. So if we factor just exclusively demand, everything changes. While the WTI curve itself, the futures curve, remains in backwardation, the level of backwardation seems to be variable tied to these, to these geopolitical premiums. Whenever there's a, 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 a potential escalation in the conflict, you see oil prices rise and the curve will backwardate even more. The big one which impacts consumers more directly, of course, is gasoline, which is partly tied to oil prices, as you would expect. But gasoline prices go through a seasonal uptick every year, January, February, March, sometimes into April. And it appears as though gasoline prices may have, have reached their seasonal peak, though we don't know for sure. That will depend on a lot of factors, starting with oil prices. And if we don't have any more supply issues and no, oil is allowed to no, uh, normalize with demand and therefore gasoline will do the same thing as at the same time that seasonal the seasonal uptick ends, we could see sharply lower gasoline prices in addition to somewhat lower oil prices. Because as I mentioned, the demand is not resurgent. In fact, the demand continues to be weak. What the Energy Information Administration reported was first of all, starting with crude oil inventories, those continue to move to the higher end of their seasonal range, which means that oil inventories are building up even though supply continues to be restricted. In fact, domestic supply has been flat for a long time here. It had increased last year during the oil price surge. It's not increasing this year with this oil price surge. The amount of crude supplied, which is the EIA's proxy for crude demand, petroleum demand, that continues to be the lower end of the seasonal range, which therefore explains inventories. There's been no uptick, no resurgence in demand for energy or petroleum, Instead, it, it continues to be really relatively weak here. So when you put these two things together, you've got weak indicated demand for petroleum plus high prices for factors that have nothing to do with demand. What that indicates further beyond the energy market is more demand destruction in other parts of the economy, just as we saw last fall. Now, that doesn't sound reflationary, nor does it sound anything like inflationary. It actually points to disinflation and maybe worse, especially when you combine that demand picture with the one we just went over in housing. The demand resurgence for reflation just doesn't seem to be anywhere. Strictly speaking, the two biggest issues with the CPI are rents and gasoline. Rents, according to the CPI, according to the, to the BLS, they must be rising at a steady rate, which we don't see any evidence for anywhere else. Builders are not building. They're doing the opposite. Other sources of rental prices say at best rents may be flat. Well, some anecdotes suggest rents might be down quite a bit. So demand isn't actually there, which means that the CPI, as far as shelter prices go, are all about the imputations. And if the other construction data from the government is correct, shelter prices, housing prices might continue to come down or at least stay flat, which will mean at some point the imputations will have to adjust. More disinflation because the demand isn't actually there. And then the other part of it, oil prices, which explain most of the variations in the headline CPI, there is and continues to be no increase in demand. Oil is all about non-economic factors. 
Therefore, at some point, oil prices are going to get past those geopolitical factors and premiums, start pricing closer to demand like they were doing last year, just before the Red Sea erupted into conflict. And that will mean even more disinflation. But more important than that, what does all of this say about the what the potential actual underlying state of the economy is? It's not resurgent in housing. It's not resurging in, in energy. What are the chances it's resurging in everything else? There is no broader reflation in the overall economy. For reflation to happen, demand needs to be rising. Instead, we continue to get all of these signs and signals that regardless of what the CPI might indicate to some, the actual un fundamental economics, they're not there for reflation. In fact, they're actually getting weaker not stronger. The recent rise in nominal U.S. Treasury yields may seem like reflation too, but there's a lot more to that story as well. That's the video got linked below. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Check out Eurodollar University Spring Sale. A couple days left on that. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members and subscribers, including all the new ones. And until next time, take care.